Hey guys, I'm Mark, and today I'm somewhere very special. Behind me is the gate to Hortalus Farm, which is a farm that belongs to my friend Rennie Reynolds and his late partner, Jack Staub. Rennie is a namesake in the field of party planning. He conducted a bunch of famous parties, namely for Studio 54 in New York City, as well as a bunch of other stuff in New York State. But he also coordinated and planned out a bunch of parties for four U.S. presidents. He's also big into landscape architecture, which he still does today. He's very well known for that. He's also written a couple books, one about party planning, which is The Art of the Party, and then he co-wrote another book with his partner, Jack, who was more of an author. Jack wrote several books in the field of horticulture, namely edible horticulture, vegetable gardening, so on and so forth. So this is their farm. They moved in here over 40 years ago. And they have evolved this place from what once was just a bare bones farm into what is now just an oasis of an incredible labyrinth of gardens, natural wild gardens in the woods, to, to a lakeside garden, to formal gardens and pathways and beautiful outbuildings and just a little bit of everything. So today, Rennie is gonna take us through and he's gonna be our guide and he's gonna tell us a little bit about each garden and his thoughts about landscape architecture as a whole. I find myself to be very fortunate to be here and to share this with you guys today because Rennie has just sold the place and within a few weeks, he's going to be moving out. So this is just a great time and a great experience that I was able to get here and do this with him. And especially while he's under the gun, doing all this stuff and trying to scramble around and get things move it's a lot i mean a property like this he's got a lot to get done before moving out so super thankful to rennie i'm super thankful to you guys i hope you enjoy this video let's go inside Okay guys, now we're here today with Rennie Reynolds. He's the mastermind himself behind Hortalus Farm and Gardens. Did I say that right? Yes, you did. Okay. You got it right, Mark. Is uh, Hortalus Farm, how'd you come up with that name? Well, it means small garden in Latin and we were looking for a name that related to um, gardens and gardening and- It uh, means small garden. Small garden. Small yes. garden. Well, this is we not a small garden. We only have 100 <laughs> acres here. <laughs> wow, well, it's a beautiful 24 place. 24 gardens on 100 acres. 24 individual gardens. Right. Okay. All right, and then just trails just going all through and amongst each one. Right. Now, what is this uh, trail right here? What do you call this? We call this the birch walk. It's uh, heritage birch trees, which are, of course, the best ones for uh, northern uh, climates. Uh, great plant, exfoliating bark. Okay. Uh, really wonderful tree. Is this the same as a so riverbank? many uses. Is this the same as a riverbank <clears throat> birch? Is it's a variety of river birch. A variety, birch. okay. Mm -hmm. Pi uh, not Pinus, uh, Betula nigra. Okay, and then you have them under planted. It looks like uh, ostrich fern all throughout here. Ostrich fern, and then down here, 
Unfortunately, it's autumn, so you can't be seeing the pedicides at the moment. But okay. it is a uh, an invasive. But when you have a hundred acres, invasive doesn't really sound so terrible. That's <laughs> probably uh, not what uh, people want to be hearing. But it's a it's still a marvelous plant. It's a native plant. Mm -hmm. uh, pedicides, butterbur, etc. It's a really wonderful plant. So ostrich fern too. I've heard people call that invasive, but I mean it's it's a yeah, I mean, it's just a wonderful plant. It covers so much territory, keeps the weeds down. And hostas in various parts of the walkway as well. Sure. Okay. So then down here, this is the uh, the main driveway that comes in to the house, right? Right. So the focal point becomes the pond as you drive down the driveway. Okay. Uh, you have this rather large pond with the swans and the geese and the ducks. I love the swans and, so and the geese and the ducks. we put this wonderful sculpture here also by James Furman. Is that a heron? Which we, what we've done in the past is had different artists showing their work, uh, outdoor sculptures in the gardens, and oh, it keeps okay. it alive. We've worked with the local James A. Michener Art Museum uh, in terms of finding the artists to have in the garden. Yeah. Um, so it, it just keeps it more interesting sure. the way the plants change every year the sculpture in the gardens changes And there's, there's just always something to see it just right. kind of extends on that exactly speaking of the geese and the ducks uh, What's your uh, what are your dogs names here? Well, this is Sadie. They're okay. all rescue kids. Hey bandit Well, that's <laughs> bandit and Parker's running around somewhere. Yeah, Sadie even though she's 11 has sort of just recently She's a Wheaton Terrier has re recently decided to be affectionate. Oh yeah. <laughs> in well, the they, past it was sort of whatever. Well, they obviously love you. They follow you around everywhere, it seems like. That's Parker, the little one. Has he got beagle in him? He definitely think? has beagle in him. Yeah. And here comes Bandit with a broken leg, but he's doing great on his splint. That's good. So the fall colors are sort of happening this year. Unfortunately, there's so much dead ash, but we won't go into that. Yeah, well, it's we're dealing with some of that too back at our place. I see you've got a lot of dogwoods all throughout the property. Love Cornus, Florida, great plant. Yeah, did you? Uh, are a lot a, of these, a lot of these volunteer. Or did you intentionally plant uh, a bunch a more? A lot of both, volunteers, but and have been here since I bought the property 42 years ago. Mm. But um, uh, we've also added a lot of cooses. I love Misatomi. Misatomi is such a gorgeous plant. Sure. And uh, uh, various of the other dogwoods. I have a very exotic one I can show you at in the uh, uh, one of the next gardens. Yeah, I love dogwoods, so definitely trying to see that. So when you, when you uh, came down this driveway, let me say for the first time 42 years ago, what was kind of... I said, that, well, I'd been looking for a property in Bucks County for two years. Okay. And the real estate agents had really given up on me, thinking I was just some nut from New York wanting to see every house that was for sale in Bucks County. Yeah. This was advertised in a newspaper. I drove down the driveway, got to right here. The pond didn't exist at this point. We built okay. this pond that had all silted in. It had originally been a pond, but it silted in. But I got to this point right here, look up, looked up at the house and said, this is it, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> but at any yeah. rate, uh, the uh, house was built uh, in the latter part of the 18th century, sort of 1790s, and uh, added on to from that point on in the 18th century. So well, you want uh, all Bucks County stone. Okay, I guess uh, field stone, right? That's the term where that came from. Is right. I guess they would uh, they would farm the surrounding fields and pull up what they had, break faces into it, and exactly put up structures. The bridge has been here uh, for probably that amount of time as well. Yeah, because I guess you said this was silted in and it was a pond and this is a stream right. that continues on through here. Hmm. Do you know what um, kind of the evolution, some of it was over the past couple hundred it years of the what they used to do here? Or? Until the depression. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's a long time. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is. And it was bought by a bootlegger who was making, they, they did the biggest bootleg bust uh, on this property that ever happened during the Depression. You're kidding. And they put the guy in jail and he escaped jail and was never seen again. So it was sold <laughs> in, I think, 1933 for uh, 
500 $324 or 500 I've forgotten exactly what it was. The property. But the whole thing. The whole, yeah, wow. Just to pay the taxes. So uh, Colonel Frazier bought it, um, and he renovated the place and did lots of wonderful things to it, so made it made it livable. So, and then we came along. There was one owner after that, uh, and then us in uh, 1979. So not too many uh, hands have been on it. No. We That's built amazing. these terraces off the back. Okay. Originally, this was the front of the house facing the stream. And I think there was a road right there, um, uh, right across the stream was probably the road as with a, a, that bridge as access. Uh, but we've, well, early, way before me, I think it must have been uh, the colonel that did it, that swung the driveway around the other side of the house. Okay. Um, but there's a, a transom on the doorway uh, that leads out onto that porch. <clears throat> you still have uh, some of the original windows, looks like, up there? Oh, yes. Some many original of, shutters, too. Many of the original windows and original shutters. That's wonderful. The porch was probably uh, built by uh, the colonel in uh, the 30s. Tony Astor, Boxwoods, Japanese Maples, the Hydrangeas. I love the steps and the terraces, especially being like dry stacked like that. Well, you know, we can find pretty great uh, stonemasons out in this part of the world. Because um, there's so much stone work that's I guess, needed. I guess the accessibility and the types of rocks too, just looking in the surrounding geology, I mean, in the streams and in the hillsides and stuff, looks like there's a lot of rocks of the right size Absolutely. to build stuff out. Build you stuff have to out be of. careful because there's a lot of slate. You don't want to build with slate, but you can it's, see those stones okay. are all local. Yeah, I love the cornerstones on there. I know, the coining's great, isn't it? They're beautiful. All right. Well, how about we walk up? You can just kind of take the reins on a lot of this, just sort of point out what you think, uh, you know, little things that you would know about that probably nobody, nobody else would. I certainly wouldn't know. Um, I definitely want to talk about some of these buildings, though. It's just, they're just so well, neat. They have so much character to you them. You can see that cornerstone. Oh, there's some paint missing up there, too, but there's a cornerstone up there, if you can see it. 1793. 1793. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Beautiful. So, so so it was built on, you can see when you said it was built on. Exactly. There's the, uh, the split right there. So the hedge looked like two giant slugs butting each other originally. <laughs> and then it got the, that fungal problem. So sure. we started cutting out the fungal problem uh. all around. And I decided to cloud prune this hedge. So it's still a work in progress. Uh, it's taken a few years to get, because boxwood's so slow growing. Uh, but I'm pretty thrilled with uh, what's happening with it. It's, it's very neat. Unfortunately, there's, you get one part perfect and then the whole branch dies, but whatever. <laughs> In this area, this was originally all lawn and um, I love the boxwood, so that boxwood topiary started very small. We've been working on it for a number of years. Um, but this, as I said, was all grass, and I started digging around one day, and right below the lawn, I was hitting rock. So I just kept digging it up, removed the lawn, and here were all these stones that must, must have been put here when the, the house was built, as this was the, oh, the, wow. the back of the house. That's just the um, way it was. Interesting plant in bloom at the moment, Leucoceptrum. This is okay. the silver-leaved one. Uh, I love Leucoceptrum. It's a really unknown shade plant. Uh, Leucoceptrum japonicum. Different varieties. As I said, this is the silver gray leaf variety. And I can't think of the uh, variety at the moment. But uh, Leucoceptrum in general as a family is a really interesting uh, variety of plants, uh, family of plants. Um, so we have variegated uh, Leucoceptrum out in the uh, yellow and variegated garden. Uh, it's just one to keep in mind for shady areas. Okay. Uh, also over here, the Tricertus that is in bloom, Tricertus herda. 
The uh, toad lilies? Yep. Fabulous gorgeous. plant. Absolutely wonderful. They look like they're from Mars. I, uh, I just met somebody recently who collects these. There's so many thing different to collect. varieties of, of Tricertus. Yeah. And then a beautiful fern back there. Oh, yeah. Okay. Right. Japanese okay. painted fern coming up in between the stones. Aren't they wonderful? I love oh, they Japanese just kind of painted fern. They just sort of volunteer themselves everywhere. Exactly. I wanted, to look, at your, I wanted to look at your. I wanted to look at your. Are these guinea hens in here? Uh, I don't know. No, I don't have any guineas at the moment. Uh, I didn't. I wasn't sure what these guys were inside they're that. They're fantail pigeons. Fantail pigeons. Along with the peacocks. Oh. Oh, inside of here, this one. These are uh, pheasants. Different oh, they're varieties. pheasants? Yeah, they're different varieties of pheasants. Okay. We usually have them in a different spot, but unfortunately a raccoon got in and... Uh, and got did his raccoon things. Yeah, <laughs> but there are... Oh, wow. I don't want the dog don't to want get the dog in, in but, there. Okay. Uh, there's red golden, yellow golden, and uh, silver pheasants. They're fabulous. Usually we have them in longer runs Look and we're working on that. That is the silver pheasant. That is beautiful. Isn't it spectacular? Oh, man. So you love your birds. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You've got, you've got a bunch of different, all kinds of animals here. I guess it's the, uh, the farm part of Portless Farm, not just the outbuildings, but now the, the livestock aspect of absolutely. it. Absolutely. You've got um, what goats and horses. You've got dogs and pheasants. Sheep. Sheep. Swans. Swans. You got that one, uh, that black swan down there that was chasing me earlier. I didn't know what to make of that. I don't know if he was flirting uh, with me or trying to intimidate me or what he was doing. Let me get the dog out of the way of the oh. truck. Whoop. Hey, Watch the walnuts. Come on, Bandit. Come on. Bandit, come on. Uh, Sadie, come on. <laughs> Parker's up there. Have a good one, you guys. What's this guy? This is a really interesting different variety oh, wow. of plant called Sininja. And oh, you can man. see that base. You gotta look at this close up. Inside of here, I wanna be, looks pretty so, delicate. You see the base on it? Isn't that wild? Do you put this in your house? Yes, the winter this time? is definitely tropical. Yeah. And it's been in a lot of shade here, but uh, which is wrong. It really prefers more sun than this. Um, and it turns silver gray with the most beautiful flowers in the springtime. Mm. They're a coral color, and they're about that big. Uh, and the coral with the silver gray of the leaves is absolutely outstanding. Mm. Really fabulous. I like how you have it showcased here. And the staghorn fern on that stand. And that seems to be a theme of yours is you just have things showcased just right. You're kind of in a place where there's not much going on and then boom. Well, I do, I do like, have a degree in landscape architecture and yeah. part of the design of gardens is not unlike uh, architecture, which is you have focal points, you have narrow spaces, the hallways in the garden, and then open spaces that are living, living room areas kind of thing. So it's just like architecture. So to get around the number of acres that we have. You'd think we had traffic in here today. <laughs> so to well, get around that number of acres, it helps to have long pathways into open spaces. It creates the interest of walking through a garden. Okay, kind of just uh, get you attracted to, hey, what's down there? Exactly. Okay. And, the, and I totally believe in having focal points, like as you walk onto this path, uh, that tall stand with the staghorn. Yeah, did you get, did you get a shot of that the staghorn? He's he's nodding. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> Do you want to go up this way or the perennial one? Uh, how about we go up the uh, the steps here and okay. check out a couple more of these buildings and things? I want to see your uh, your pigeons. Well, yes, and we can go to the French garden up here as well. Yes. Hello. Good. We got a nice one. Are you enjoying the garden? Yeah. <laughs> good, good, good. Well, want to go look at the French so, garden first? Or? Well, this, this is the cutting garden. Okay. 
We call it the cutting round. At it's first, round. we thought it. Yes, exactly. At first, we thought it would be interesting to have all the flowers mixed and just pick where we wanted. It looked pretty awful, so now we have them in quadrants. We still, at times, sort of call it that public library garden. <laughs> <laughs> It's really um, hard to, anyway, it just. I see how you have the, uh, the stones laid out in there. Right. Kind of sectioning it beautiful, off. beautiful pot. Let's do the French garden first, and then we'll go back to the <clears throat> aviary. So is that a, uh, is that the Eiffel Tower? That is why this is the French garden. Is that why this is the French garden? We were traveling through gardens in England and came upon an antique shop in Broadway. And this Eiffel Tower was standing outside. And I never thought at whatever that is, 18, 20 feet, whatever, that we, we would be able to have it shipped back to the US. At the time, I was doing all of the French American Foundation uh, events in New York City, the Waldorf. The guy at the antique shop in England said, oh, no problem, I can ship that. So uh, this has danced in the center of the uh, ballroom of the Waldorf Astoria several times, even wow. made a trip to Minneapolis to do a French theme party in uh, Minneapolis. That's awesome. But what we have are these parterres or quadrants here with the topiary lilacs in the center of the triangular ones over here. Okay. All different varieties of boxwoods, including the variegated boxwoods forming the, the star or the etoile around the base of the Eiffel Tower. Um, some Kingsville dwarf boxwoods, uh, Korean box, um, all different varieties in here. That, uh, and it's surrounded by Viburnum macrocephalum, which I think is a fantastic plant really underused. You don't see it as uh, much as you should in, in gardens. It's a parent of Carli uh, Viburnum carlisi, so it has uh, some of the scent, but gets huge, giant balls. They start off as small sort of lime green uh, balls and then just develop and open up into uh, snow white uh, flowers. It, it's just spectacular. And then, of course, the hydrangeas, which the viburnums look like, uh, come along at a later time. So when do the viburnums go? Uh, through the month of May. That's why I like okay. them so much, too. They really, they look, start looking showy, sort of early part of May, and then by the end, they're then you got blown out, and then the hydrangeas come along. I've noticed With, that a lot here, is you have, um, you have plants in different stages all together, so that you have color extended throughout the season instead right. of just flashing the pan. Just well, seems to be. as you saw, we just had some guests uh, visiting, so um, we're open to the public generally seven days a week. Okay. So you want to have as much of interest for guests. Always try to have something to see. Right. All right. Exactly. I think one of the ways to do that also is um, visiting garden centers or nurseries, whatever, Mm -hmm. throughout the year sure. and so if you see things in bloom in April you figure out where they might go in your garden and then the ones in May and June and July so you get that sequence so it doesn't become just a May garden or just a July garden or whatever it's hard to avoid that in terms of some of the color things but you can still extend the interest in color and look in a garden and it's not just all about uh, the color of flowers um, the Brits have so much to teach us about all this, and really the color of foliage is hugely important. We'll talk about that later when we get out to the pool garden. Different textures and things, too. Absolutely. Yeah. That's an interesting point that you said about the, uh, well, a very a good point that you said about visiting the, uh, the different garden centers around throughout the year, because, you know, I know for us at our nursery, we have just a huge flush in spring, and then it's just pretty much it for, for a ways out. And uh, people don't get to experience a lot of the plants that show themselves during the later part of the year. I mean, it just looks like a, a stick with some leaves on it during the time that they're there right. in the spring. And they just, a lot of those plants don't, 
wind up uh, selling as much <laughs> just because, you know, you, they're not People there. People lose interest by the end of the yeah, season. Yeah, they're not shining. I mean, you, you don't sell um, winter berry hollies until, you right. know, the people come in for fall mums. They just don't know. They're just They're not showy. Or beauty berry, which I think is a fabulous oh, yeah. plant. I love beauty berry. I just found out you can eat it, too. Oh, yes? You know, yeah, you oh, can make I didn't a know that. jam out of it. Uh -huh. yeah. So, peacocks here. Now, I would love to be letting these peacocks roam. Uh, but the problem is the peak hen will go out and create a nest and then uh, unlike the geese who will create a nest and leave it, forget where they put it or whatever, the pea hen will be an absolutely fabulous mother and not leave that nest and uh, she then becomes prey to raccoons and foxes mm. and everything else. So, uh, and the, the other birds are fantail pigeons. Are they... Um no, I don't know anything about pigeons, but are these like carrier pigeons? Could they be used for that? Or I mean, do yes, people... they could actually. That's probably fantails that are. I, I I don't really know about carrier pigeons either, um, but we love the the uh, the whole mix of colors is really great. It is incredible, and the fantails make them, you know, an interesting. It it again creating interest for us and for the visitors to the garden. Oh yeah. I, lo I love that one, the gray, the white, and the black one there. I know, isn't kinda, that fantastic? Kind of head like that. Now, Beautiful. here's a point in terms of that. You know, a lot of people don't like the um, don't like variegated plants. Vita Sackville West, the great garden writer, was one of those people. And uh, I love variegated plants. I think all the different variegations in plants are spectacular. So that's why we have a, a yellow and variegated garden. <laughs> Well, what was it? Was this originally a bird cage, or was well, this like, like a corn crib? No, or supposed it was, to? It was so. It it's came from Iowa, okay. and it's meant to be a uh, corn drying uh, bin. And just at the end of, end of the conversation, as I was ordering this, uh, I said to the guy, "I'm actually using it as an aviary." He said, "Oh, I'm so glad you told me because we have a different door on it from uh, <laughs> the ones that are sold for uh, food bins." So this is a somewhat smaller door. Okay. Uh, and he said, I'm selling more as aviaries now uh, than I am of drying bins. Oh wow. <laughs> and they're just so, they're just cool and content in here. They don't need like a like a chicken likes to have a box or anything. They just kind of stay in here. Yep. Yeah. Gosh, those peacocks are something else. Aren't they? When do they call? When do they? I mean, I know the peacocks. They uh, make a pretty spring when he's anxious to uh, play with his mate. <laughs> okay. Yeah, the uh, I remember the one of the ponds where I used to um, I used to go fishing a lot as a kid. I know one of the farmers had peacocks or something like this because you could hear them from the next farm over. It was just <laughs> such a cool sound, and it took me years to figure out what it was. It's like, why? What is this kind of bird that lives in this part of the county and not in my part of the county? It sounds like a screaming baby, actually. Sort of, yeah. So why don't we go through the vegetable garden? It's a bit empty sure. this time of year, but I'll show you the layout and the, okay. the thought behind it. It's a wild vegetable garden. I love the raised beds. Well, that's the whole thing about vegetable gardening. Um, my late partner, Jack, who wrote the books about Hortalis, the book about Hortalis Farm and various other books, he wrote books on herbs and vegetables mm -hmm. and fruit trees. I have um, several of them. I've, I've got to admit, I haven't haven't read them. There are a lot of, like a lot of them, uh, other ones in my books, I just have them up on a shelf and haven't quite cracked them open I know too the much feeling. yet. No, I know the feeling. Yeah, I got it's a lot fine. of books. But... You'll enjoy them on a winter day. Yeah. But uh, we became great friends with Rosemary Beery, who was a spectacular garden designer in England who had the wonderful garden Barnsley House. And Rosemary would visit us here, and she and Jack would talk veg vegetables endlessly. But her outlook on the vegetable garden is that it can be every bit as beautiful as any other part of your garden. Yeah. And that vegetable gardens should be, you know, lifted in one's esteem in terms of the aesthetic. And to do that, she referred to her vegetable garden with the French term potager. So okay. she had her potager. And so this one, uh, Jack would refer to as well as the potager. Um, climbing beans here. Uh, 
since he's been gone, I have to say that this was really his realm and it hasn't been uh, uh, taken care of to the point that it was previously. But these would be runner beans. It would be climbing spinach, uh, all sorts of things. We have pictures of him holding a bean this long, Jeez. and it's called yard-long white snake. And the thing would <laughs> actually they would be longer than that. They were pretty bizarre looking, yeah. <laughs> looking things. But the whole point is by the vertical things to increase your real estate in the garden so that mm -hmm. things are growing up and not taking the space of spreading out. And then... Um, Especially if you're going to be building a fence around the whole thing too, to keep out the right. other things that want to eat exactly. your stuff. Exactly. And as Rosemary would point out, the raised beds should be... So, excuse me, Mark, mm -hmm. I'm just going to... Come back here? Or? Well, here's good. But see the, the width of this? Mm -hmm. I can reach in right. and still get to something without climbing into and the, the bed and compacting the soil mm -hmm. or standing on another plant, et cetera. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, mine are a little wider than that. <laughs> I've got a couple little clever tricks about how I get in there, but I don't know. And we kept raising, as we were getting older, we kept raising the beds higher, so. Uh, it's Spilanthes. A toothache, toothache plant. Oh, it is? Yeah, it's a toothache plant. It's, um, if you chew on it, you won't be able to talk for a couple of days. Uh, There's a, I'll somebody, keep in mind not to. <laughs> Actually, this that. plant is a great one. It's, um, it's the shrub honeysuckle okay. uh, that I originally got from Rosemary Veery's Barnsley House Nursery. And uh, it's Lanicera knitted at Bagasin's Gold. Uh, usually, the foliage is all yellow, um, like this. It's a, it's a bright sort of chartreuse green. But what's fun about it, and we haven't done it to this one, but you can shape these as you would a boxwood. Mm. If you want it to be a ball, if you want it to be several ball topiary, you can do that with this plant. Yeah, it kind of um, grows like that, you can see. The Brits refer to it as false boxwood. Hmm. Can you eat it? Does it have a culinary purpose to it? or? I don't think so. Um, yeah. Is that celery? The apple trees over the arbor here. Oh, have that's been wonderful. A long time coming. And to, again, to make the vegetable garden look more beautiful. The topiary boxwoods in the four quadrants here really add a lot to the whole vegetable garden look. Yeah. Well, it makes it just seem bigger, too. Not only just taking advantage of the space, but I think it makes it, if these weren't here, these vertical elements, I think the place would look smaller than right. the way it looks now. Exactly. And a variegated boxwood. I love variegated boxwoods. You'll see more uh, on our yes. trip. Yes, I, uh, you've got some, some huge ones in the back there. I never realized I got that big. I guess anything with time. I love your, uh, your gate closure mechanism here. Did you get that? The Williamsburg gate closing. Is that what it's 18th called? 18th century, yep. So as you let it go, the weight falls and it closes the gate. Come on, hey, Sadie, pup. come on out, honey. <laughs> Good girl. She says, I don't want to miss a tour. So that's another corn crib, right? Uh, another corn crib. That's the one that is apparently storing wood now, but it did have the pheasants in it before. Okay. Beautiful building. You have chrysanthemums coming up. Don't need to get them to stop that for a minute. Oh, no, they're good. Okay. Still working for them. Okay. So I generally don't love Alberta spruce. Mm -hmm. I've never specified it on a landscape job I've done. And I generally don't like chrysanthemums. I know that's like I shouldn't be saying, right? But uh, I can't stand the grocery store yellow mums mixed with the purple mums mixed with the white all in one group. If you're going to do that for fall color, make them all yellow or all purple or all white. But really mixing them becomes, I think, a disaster. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm an opinionated old guy. But <laughs> at any rate... Oh, that's this how you got to where you are, right? chrysanthemum is a fabulous one. It's called Sheffield Pink. And okay. it's just opening now. And I'm sorry, I don't see one here that's open to show you. But um, it's, it's just about there, though. It's just about there. It's a smaller than the grocery store variety. Mm -hmm. uh, smaller flower, but pale pink with a little yellow center. Beautiful, beautiful flower. Interesting. And as you see, it makes a great ground cover. Look at the way, this is the lily garden, 
and uh, it makes a great ground cover under the lilies. Again, you got something coming up behind something else. So this is the herb garden. So you are taking the big pieces. Yeah. <laughs> Bob changed your mind? Oh no, this is what I had in mind. Oh good. It's an old garden shed that I bought at the New York Botanical Garden, Garden Antique Show years ago and meant to put together as a garden folly. It's going off to be the backdrop of a wedding for this weekend for a friend of ours in the neighborhood. Oh, awesome. So this is the, be, the be herb neat. garden with you see some very happy basil still happening. Oh yeah. And a great boxwood. Love this variety. It's Graham Blandy. Grows as a pillar. and. It just, it's a, it's a wonderful plant. Look at how pretty those are. Yeah, they're wonderful. Those have been around a long time. Um, is that a uh, downy mildew resistant variety of basil? Do you know? I mean, for I, it to look that good I this time of year. I don't know that, honestly. It's, it's, yeah, it's looking great. So I said before how I don't love Alberta spruce, mm -hmm. but I had flower shops all around New York City and the perfect Christmas apartment size Christmas tree was an Alberta spruce. Oh, uh, yeah. About this size in a pot, and we'd put lights and decorations on it and so forth. But we always had them left over at the end of the season. Oh, and I okay. couldn't stand to throw them away. I mean, they were live plants. Yeah. Hey, Bob, can you guys hang on that for a minute? I think, honestly, our microphones won't pick a lot of that up. Okay, fine. They're just kind of, they're close to our voice, so. Okay. We should be all right. So, um, Alberta spruce, I've never loved them, but I had them left from these Christmas trees from my shops, and I brought them out here, planted them here, and then decided, okay, the way they're going to look better, for one thing, the plant will be full all the way to the ground, mm -hmm. and it's so thick that it ends up getting spider mite, and people wondering, wonder why their Alberta spruces as their foundation plantings are dying, it's mm -hmm. because they're so tight and the spider mite gets in there. Okay. So I decided to prune them up. Yeah. And you can see what's happened here. It's like this marvelous lily uh <laughs> forest oh, that's of wonderful. spruce trees. So that airs them out and it really just contributes to That gets the to air it. through and that's why you seldom see Alberta spruce this tall. Yeah. But it's because they've gotten the air uh, circulation, etc. That's fantastic. Oh, they make great standards. Don't they? Yeah. I know. Hey, you can see through the rest of the garden, especially with, uh, with the way the walkways are shaped and all that. It, gets, it allows you to appreciate it more. And the it's sundial neat. that I found in England. Of course, all the great garden ornaments were from uh, uh, Europe or England. So how do you come across a lot of this stuff? Do you just... Um, you look for it. You look for it? You look in like auction <laughs> listings and things or shops? No, I or... don't go that far. But when I'm traveling, if I see things... Okay. Um, yeah, and usually they're either concrete or stone or iron, which makes them so easy to transport. <laughs> I'll bet. Or they're 20 feet tall like you're... Uh... Exactly. <laughs> so this is a kiwi that I had in the greenhouse at one point. Okay. Feel that stem. Isn't that fabulous? The yeah, it is. It, you would think it was going to hurt you at first, but and it's actually just like And look at how red it is. Yeah. That's so wonderful. I thought it was an interesting plant. I picked it up somewhere. I don't remember where. And I thought it was tropical, so we had it in the greenhouses for a long time. And then it was about to overtake the greenhouse. I thought, okay, this, this has to go. So we planted it down here, and it's hardy. Hmm. Uh, this one needs um, a mate to fruit, so we don't know whether it's female or male, and I don't know where to find it if I could. <laughs> so we have it here as an interesting plant. But these are self-fertile kiwis over here. And these are kind of interesting. I'm not sure there's anything left on here. To, no, I don't, I don't see any at this point. But it's a self-fertile kiwi, and it makes a wonderful um, vine growing on this uh, uh, trellis that Bob created. How, so, uh, how long has that been there, you think, maybe? This has been here prob Look at this yeah, trunk. you can see the trunk on it as well. It's probably 20 years. Now, what Bob did that was very interesting, and you can see it over here, because he and Rose, who've been helping here for 35 or six years, um, live in that house, and he was afraid this wouldn't look nice in the winter. So he wanted to be able to take these 
trellises that these are growing on out of here in the winter. So he put them in PVC pipes so he can simply lift them out. Yeah. So that was, a, I thought that was a pretty cool idea. That is neat. So let's go up this way. I like your solution to your fig. Oh, you know what I, <laughs> yes, and then that'll go in the garage for the winter. Mm -hmm. This is, I don't know if you can get a decent shot of this, but it's Ponsiris trifoliata, the hardy citrus tree. It's a sour uh, and orange this, or? Uh, yes. Well, you can see these yeah. citruses on here now, the fruit. I'll put my hand there so it'll. <laughs> At any rate, these are uh, quite sour, but apparently the thing to do with them, they'll turn orange shortly, and you cut them up and rub them on the inside of a salad bowl to give flavor to the salad, and apparently it's a wonderful citrusy, sour kind of flavor. But we've kept mm. this uh, uh, pruned to be a standard or whatever, not really a standard, but a shaped tree. Um, needs some hair cutting at the moment. But it's, uh, yeah, to see the trunks, I mean, it's a gorgeous trunk, especially as it's starting to get older like that. I know, isn't it? And it's it has wonderful. great flowers in uh, May into June that are just like citrus flowers with that wonderful scent. Yes. Let's go this way. Okay. A cozy bench under a, an arborvitae. Now this tree, Should be a champion, the way the you know the Brits have their champion trees around England. I think this would be called a champion shagbark hickory. That's beautiful. You have to see the uh, trunk on this and the uh, shagbark hickory. It's just a spectacular tree. Yeah, I don't I don't think I've ever seen one quite like this. It's amazing. Very slow it's growing tree. It's, it's a couple of hundred years old. Mm -hmm. That's Native why that tree, wonderful plant. Very, very hard wood. Gorgeous. Fringe tree, which is beautiful in bloom, and look at the fruit on it now. Can you eat this? It's really beautiful black fruit, fruit cayenanthus. Can, um, can you eat them? I don't know, I wouldn't try it because I don't know, I've never tried, <laughs> and I'm still here. <laughs> that might be something we have to Google before we leave. Cyananthus, C-H-I-O-N-A-N-T-H-U-S. The blueberries should have been cut way back long ago, but I was afraid I'd kill them. So uh, this was an equipment shed maybe at one point? Years or ago, garage, and it's been our chicken coop for a long time. This is just one of, but there are lots of chickens. I think they're inside due to the heat of the day. Put a uh, put an arbor on the side of it. And yes, exactly. They got wisteria. Well, this part is... of the reason for this is to give the chickens some shade mm -hmm. outside, and also to keep the chicken hawks from eating them. Okay. So it just it uh, provides beautiful. a canopy that they can't see through. Right, and it provides a beautiful, uh, the wisteria provides beautiful color uh, uh, when it's in bloom. I bet the wisteria is well fed too. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they got boxwoods around it. This is, this is wonderful. And then the espaliate apple tree over there. Oh, okay. I was wondering what that was from back down there. I wanted to come over and look at that. That's awesome. Is that just one tree? Well, that's just one tree, isn't it? It was original. Uh, the first plant that I put here was the espaliate apple from uh, its Luthart in uh, Center Mauritius. Sells these, creates them, and sells them uh, on Long Island, Center Mauritius, Long Island. Um, I think it's Luthart Nurseries, at any rate. Um, it was the first plant I bought because I knew I wanted an espaliate apple on the side of the barn here. Mm -hmm. It grew all the way to the top, and I was the one who'd get up on the ladder to prune it and so forth, because I really loved it. And it suddenly died, just, su just I don't know why, but suddenly died, and I thought, well, that probably saved my life from being, you know. <laughs> uh, and now I planted this one a few years ago, and it's grown so rapidly, um, but I'm not doing the top anymore. Uh, I don't think that's in the AARP suggested manual. <laughs> So now we move to the more formal parts of the garden. Okay. 
I guess I'll point out the structure of this Kentucky coffee tree. Absolutely fabulous. Uh, that's been there. Uh, the tree man uh, thinks about 200, the arborist, I should say, thinks about 250 years. Amazing structure. Yeah, this, this, this limb coming down is just getting wonderful. Getting close to the end point of its... Uh, of its life. We've been feeding and cajoling for the last few years, but just the way its structure is. So now we're moving into the perennial borders, which, um, as you know, take more time and maintenance than any other part of the garden. Uh, it does look wonderful through all uh, months of the year, or at least I think so. It needs attention right now. Um, but it's all based on the English perennial borders of the soft, relaxing colors, mm -hmm. serene colors of pinks, lavenders, blues, grays, and white. Mm -hmm. Some pastel so, sort of feeling to it. Exactly. And so you, it's quite traditional in that sense. Uh, but it's also not just perennial plants, but you can see the various trees and larger shrubs in there. So um, they play with the whole thing. Let's see if the lesbides is still in bloom. Of course, the phlox. Well, there's a monk's hood still poking up. Mm. And some phlox still playing around in here. A variegated persicaria that actually, it's a persicaria that minds its manners, Japanese knotweed. Uh, most of them run all over the place, but this one actually uh, doesn't. It really does sort of keep to its own uh, territory. Oh, it looks like the Lesbides has gone past. This is a shrub that's so underused and it's so beautiful when it's in bloom. What's it called again? Lesbidesa. That is a waterfall of uh, sort of rose-colored, pinky, uh, pink to magenta-colored flowers. Well, let's talk about this over here, the hardy begonia, begonia grandis. Oh, they're, they're hardy, huh? And this is, hmm. yeah, well, it's actually a self-seeder rather than okay. being hardy. But look at those gorgeous, I mean, that amount of flower and that color of pink against the color of green is really, I think, spectacular. Yeah, that's wonderful. With the regular wood aster behind that sort of creeped in and we didn't pull out because it can become quite a weed. Even some roses still blooming. Among my favorite plants in the garden are these variegated uh, rows of Sharon's. Mm -hmm. The variegation, I think, is fantastic, and the flowers are the palest pink, which again, it's flooded with flowers. It's, it's, it's just completely covered with these pale pink flowers in June, and uh, the, that color against the sort of grayish uh, gray and white foliage is just spectacular. Yeah, the green itself is just a little more silvery than a typical one. Right. It's, it's and very the, nice. to have them as sort of corner posts here, the sedum, autumn joy still blooming. Can we say hi to your horse? Is he out here? Oh, absolutely. Well, I'm not sure <laughs> she is. It's she? Petunia. Petunia. She was. There was a horse out here earlier. Petunia. Well, maybe on the way back, it could be that the sun. Yeah, maybe she she's taking a nap somewhere. Shade. Or water down by the stream. Oh, there, oh, she, there is. she is. Sticking her head. <laughs> Tunya! Do you ride her? Uh, no, that's why she's, she's here. Kinda, she we just kind of yeah. hangs out. We give a home to retired horses. That's awesome. Yeah. We usually have two, but Smokey died not long ago, and we haven't uh, uh, replaced him. She's beautiful. So how'd you get involved with um, with Studio 54 back in the... Well, I had done a couple of notable parties in New York. Uh, the presentation of Opium Perfume for Yves Saint Laurent. Okay. And uh, some other big parties. Uh, so did you start out with party planning kind of from, from the beginning? No, I started out with a plant shop in Greenwich Village. <laughs> oh, okay. And then it became cut flowers, and that led into doing large-scale parties, which became the most profitable part of the business. 
and it still exists uh, in New York and Palm Beach as Rennie and Reed. I gave the business to my nephew in 2004. So he's grown it dramatically. So he's having a wonderful time doing that now in yeah. New York and Palm Beach. But the Studio 54 years were very interesting. I did the first party there and it was very well, it became very well known. We have some more garden guests coming. Maybe we'll keep going. Yeah, we'll uh, find a more private spot. Yeah, that's uh, um, <laughs> that's an interesting line of work. I can't, I can't say I've ever met a professional party planner before. <laughs> well, it's now, pretty neat. Now you have Mark. But we, at uh, any rate, we, we, uh, he he actually wrote a book called what is it called? The Art of the, the Party. Art of the Party, designed for entertaining. And that's supposed to be like the book to have for party planning. Well, understand. it's got some pretty interesting pictures of wild parties from the 80s through the <laughs> 90s and so forth. But yeah. the Studio 54 thing was fun for uh, the three years that it lasted. We did the first party that uh, sent Studio 50 fame into uh, Studio 54 into its uh, fame. And that was the one for Bianca Jagger's birthday when she rode in on a white horse that I ended up getting from the stables up uh, in the northern part of Manhattan. And we had uh, the cast from Oak Calcutta, which at that point was quite um, shocking because it, they were in the nude and uh, in the show Oak Calcutta, et cetera. So Leading we the horse through or? To come over. So Bianca rode in on a white horse and we had balloons falling from the sky. So. Uh, for its time, it was so, somewhat revolutionary, and uh, I just kept doing the parties, all the parties at 54 throughout its three years of infamacy. <laughs> do you see, like, insp where do you draw inspiration from? Is it just kind of like pop into your head? Well, I was really lucky that after um, graduating college in landscape architecture and urban and regional planning, I wanted to see the world, so I got a job as a tour escort. Uh, oh. for a company called Intrav that I believe still exists out of St. Louis and traveled all over the world. And okay. so the things that I saw during those travels became continued inspiration for parties, gardens, interior, whatever, you uh, know? Yeah, you say to yourself, so I bet they'd never seen something like that back home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's pretty cool. So travel is a wonderfully mind and visual expanding experience. Sure. Yeah. When you talk to people that are well traveled, you can sort of tell almost by get just by. I don't know if you do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like when you meet somebody that's well traveled, you can sort of see it in the way that they act and talk and oh yes, well and, I uh, don't know and interact. <laughs> I can tell with you. I, I say he's he's been places. You can just. Uh, I feel very lucky to have traveled that much. So, the story of this area out here is that this was a hillside just as the previous one, mm -hmm. and I wanted an area. Uh, where we could have large-scale parties for not-for-profit organizations in okay. Bucks County. So we got uh, bulldozers and whatever big equipment in and cut on that side and filled over here to make this giant circle. And then I wanted a swimming pool, but I didn't want it to look like a regular swimming pool. I wanted it to look like a garden fountain. So this is a 45-foot diameter uh, swimming pool. Yeah. Uh, that is a gar it looks like a garden pool with the stones all around the edge with Enothera and thyme and uh, various other plants. Uh, the first week or two in June, uh, that garden is aglow and it's um, an unusual color combination of yellow and pink. But mm -hmm. if you read Christopher Lloyd's book, he loved the idea of doing things like that and he actually did yellows and pinks together also. And yeah. it ends up looking pretty fabulous. They're soft enough yellows and pinks that they play together nicely. Especially even coming out of the uh, out of the alley that leads to it. Yes, exactly. So you have a lot of the, the pastel sort of stuff going on in there. We have those pastels, but you see what I forgot to mention when we first came out here, because we were on parties, and that is <laughs> this whole garden is a summer border. Okay. And it's yellows, orange, the brighter colors of, of uh, summer. So throughout July, this is all bright yellows, oranges, reds, etc. cetera. So, mm. um, and then you see, again, this is what I was uh, mentioning earlier about color in foliage. Look at even right now, mm -hmm. even those weeping beech, which are looking pretty green now, 
Yeah. In the springtime, those are red, just dark mahogany. Actually, uh, that's not a good description, but uh, they're just burgundy color, and they're amazingly strong. And look at the way the colors of the barberry, the red barberry there, mm -hmm. and the dogwoods for fall color up there yeah. um, make such a difference. And then those variegated uh, grasses. Um, it's not like an elephant grass? I, I don't know what that is. I've never seen those before. I, didn't, I was going to ask you about that. But. They're fabulous, aren't they? And yeah. I'm drawing a blank on the name. Yeah, they're beautiful. <laughs> you see the dog. <laughs> Look at that tail. Could that tail wag faster? Yeah, they. Uh, She's. They, they have a good life here. Can... In there. Right. <laughs> he comes back with the fur rubbed off his nose by having done so much. <laughs> those uh, the buckeyes starting to turn yellow. There is that what those are. Uh, yes, those are Aeschylus parviflora. Thank you for pointing that out, Mark, because those are wonderful plants. You can see I've got two on each side there, and then mm -hmm. the one over on that side. Um, yeah. Fantastic, uh, large shrub, small tree. Yeah, wonderful. It's, plant. it's just the right size for a certain for a yeah. lot of applications. Well, the scale of this area is pretty big. Yeah. So that's why I've mixed in the small tree, the tall trees, the smaller trees, and the uh, uh, perennials. Yeah, and then cool. on each side or each kind of corner of the circle, if there is such a thing. Uh, are the Ilex opaca, the American holly, which I love. Mm -hmm. Great, great plant. We just put a whole bunch of those in at the farm, 43 of them. Um, one of the people there planted them 30 years ago in a grid, and now they're like 30 feet tall and had a tree spade come in the past week and move them all out into the what was the horse pasture. Oh, great. Yeah, it's a, it's pretty transforming like all of a sudden in five days you got right. 43 hollies that are you know that tall this is the fun of all this it's called playing god <laughs> yeah it's uh it's it's fast especially you don't have to wait for it great so. plant could use a little trimming here pruning whatever but uh, i love catoni esters mm. sometimes we let it even just drip over the uh, side of the pool into yeah. the pool so now we're moving to the Japanese maple garden. And okay. I want to make sure you see these lyrical gates. I found those at the New York Botanical Garden, Garden Antique Show as well. And they didn't have these posts with them. I found the posts afterwards. Huh. And Bob, who can do everything here, uh, welded the gates to the posts and we uh, painted them all the same color and they looked like they were always made to be. They, they do, together. they look like they, they look like they were made together. So the Japanese maple garden, these supposed to be globosa uh, blue spruce have grown way larger than ever, I ever thought they would. So um, I thought they'd stay smaller. So basically I want to sort of cut them back because that Japanese maple in the springtime and now is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. But the, the texture and the color thing going on here is pretty interesting. This Japanese maple is Aconitifolium. And again, it, uh, look at the shape of it. It's absolutely yeah. spectacular. The leaf reminds me of one uh, my mother has called Cascade. Uh -huh. It's one of the cultivars. Well, Aconitifolium, it's like the Aconitum. The foliage looks exactly like Aconitum, the monkshood. So I am crazy for hardy uh, uh, geraniums. Mm -hmm. um, I think they are one of the best garden plants you can have. For one thing, if deer get in, which they have, you can see there, you, well, you can't see any hosta because the deer <laughs> have eaten them all. There's a couple little stems poking through down there. Right, and that's all they leave are the stems. But at any rate, uh, this is Ingersen's blue, and it's just such a great. They'll tolerate sun, this variety, and shade. Mm -hmm. It's just. Um, Super plant. Do you get the scent that's even coming right now from the wetness and the uh, the, the foliage? Mm -hmm. uh, You're having you know, a mass it like this. Because the dog just walked through it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, at any rate, absolutely fabulous plant. A variegated Japanese maple. Mm -hmm. We have too many to talk about all of them, so we'll go over to one of my favorites, okay. or actually two. 
There are two of them here since it's my favorite. It's a pretty magnolia, a couple of them there. But it's hard to say favorite. I, I know, the magnolia grandiflora here. I, I love playing with the textures of the foliage. So mm -hmm. look at this uh, oh, Shishigashira, yeah. Japanese maple right here uh -huh. with the foliage of the grandiflora magnolia. It's yep. really fun. That's about as different as you can get. And the, here's a totally underused but fantastic ground cover. And it's called, uh, it's a euonymus, and it's called Oolong's Ghost. And look at, once again, it has a bit of variegation, the veining through the length of that narrow uh, leaflet. It's, just, it's really a fantastic ground cover. It's, uh, it almost looks, I don't know if it's just me, but it all looks like it's going one direction. Yes. And it tries to grow up the side of that uh, oh, Shishiga shear, and then we cut it back. Okay. Do you think it knows because this is the hill, and just that slight bit of hill, that it's kind of growing <laughs> that way uphill? I don't I, know, but it does. Maybe it's the sun also. I'm not really yeah. sure. You get it too, though. It's not just me. Oh, I'm yeah, not going absolutely. It's yeah, going that it direction. It is going. So this is a... Um, uh, I just, I, um, it looks like hydrangea petiolaris. Uh, uh, oh, it's climbing hydrangea? Yes, but it's not. It's, um, hold on, hold on a minute. I had it and then I was thinking Shishigashira. Uh, oh, well, we may have to come back to that. <laughs> Is this on an ash tree? Yes. So it won't be too much longer. Right, maybe exactly. potentially. Oh, wonderful. Do you know that dogwood? No, I don't. Neither do I. But it's, <laughs> it's got great, white berries it? on it, yeah. Berries? So beautiful. That's incredible. So you got, what, three of them there? Yes. So they make even more of a punch. Yeah. So why don't we go back to this, since finally it made it through the uh, weaker brain cells. Schizophragma is a fabulous plant. Okay. I love schizophragma. There's schizophragma hydrangeoides moonlight, which has a gray leaf, and it's spectacular with white flowers. This is actually the pink variety of schizophragma. So it has a soft pink leaf. And you can see the flower head here and how much, again, it looks like hydrangea. It does. I, it's, when you started saying that, I'm like, are you sure that's not hydrangea? So I'm kind of thinking to myself. I but. am. It's schizophragma. <laughs> that's, uh, that's something. And, uh, well, it's just a great plant. It's mm -hmm. a really, really good plant. So, here's one that whenever I have ever so knowledgeable horticulturists here, this is the one that always stumps the stars. You got me. I have a guess on the family or anything. Is it a dogwood? Good work. <laughs> now, how did you come by that, I, Mark? I don't know. It just kind of looks like it. It actually the is top, a dogwood. The top's up here. Yeah. It's a dogwood. Cornus erecta. And wow. I got it from a wonderful nursery uh, called Broken Arrow Nursery uh, near that's, New Haven. Do you know Broken Arrow? That's, that's John, one of the guys at our nursery, one of our friends, neighbor. That's like his favorite nursery. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. They have great stuff. And Adam mm -hmm. is the plant curator there. Mm -hmm. And he's a great guy, knows his plants. I bought this from Adam a number of years ago. It was a single stem about this, about that big. <laughs> and look at the way it spread. Yeah. Yeah, it's coming back up through the, uh, some, some rhizomes, I guess. Another Japanese maple. Well, we really picked a good day to do this. You certainly did. <laughs> so you have, uh, I can hear the, the microphone probably won't pick that up, but we got geese coming in, flying in. Or I flying guess, uh, out. Or flying out. <laughs> Is this a frequent pit stop, I guess, during the fall, winter? Do you, do you typically see them hitting your pond? I mean, do they? Uh, oh, yeah. Or do they just kind of hang out as residents? Oh, no, they fly through and hit the ponds for sure.
you have irrigation throughout yeah. a lot of yeah. this property. Well, there's our bandit. <laughs> He's doing really well for white sailing him. Yeah, that was a good day to be out and for any animal. So we call this our temple canis or dog temple where our past dogs are buried or oh. remembered. Okay. Yeah, I, was, I saw these uh, when I walked through last time. I wasn't quite sure what it was, but... Yeah. This is, uh, what a great place to, uh, to use as a vantage point for that. Exactly. It's amazing. I mean, you're in such a good bit of canopy and shade here, and then to have that all illuminated right through there in the background is pretty incredible. Exactly. And then the alley behind us, or in front of us now, I should say, mm -hmm. is all white pine uh, with alternating dogwood. This came about from me having a terrible time trying to buy this side of the property uh, from the man who, every time I showed interest, doubled the price on the property. So finally, a friend of mine bought it. Uh, cause it, he knew that because I was here and wanted it that he could Because you wanted to expand your place. Yeah. He knew you'd get so more out of it. So a friend bought it at the reasonable price and then we worked all that out. So uh, I, had I planted all the white pine as a barrier to uh, what I thought might happen as a development there. And then when we were able to get it, we brought in a tree spade and moved the white pines to create this alley and we used the tree spade to pull the native dogwoods out of the field and intersperse them every other one so that when it's, uh, the dogwood is blooming in the springtime, you see the white flowers all the way up against sure. the dark green of the uh, white pines. And you've also got the hydrangeas in here for later in the season too. Exactly. Again, you've got that, that staggered approach to always having something of interest. So all through July and August, you've got these hydrangeas showing up against all of the uh, white pines. And then mm -hmm. you see the way these variegated boxwoods oh, yeah. are lining the walk as well. They go all the way up and lead to giant variegated boxwoods at the top. And there's some caryopteris thrown in as well. Yeah, this is great. Just uh, definitely draws you in. Say, huh, oh, what's up here? Well, again, it's part of the design of having the hallway to the next open space. Mm -hmm. We've been in that big open space, and now we're walking through this hallway that should be delightful at any time of year. You can now really see the way these variegated boxwoods are popping out as well. Yeah. I'll bet in the wintertime, too, this is very interesting. It is. There's, with the there's snow, snow on out it. here, yeah. Especially if you're the first person to walk through and there's no tracks here at all. And then mm -hmm. you see my whole point about having focal points and vistas. Yeah. A 12-foot urn. Yeah, that's... Uh, <laughs> Also raised up on a stone platform, but... Uh, that, that took more than uh, two guys to move that, I'm sure. Yeah, it did. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's one piece of bronze, that's for sure. Where did that come from? Uh, I think... Uh, I, f I found it in New York. I think perhaps it was made in Mexico, but I love the scale of it, so. Yeah. Its provenance didn't matter at that point. That's wonderful. But look at the way those variegated boxwoods that we've just walked through have mm -hmm. these huge variegated boxwoods on each side of the urn. Yeah. And then these fastidic cop <clears throat> excuse me, fastidic copper beech. Uh, okay. They're absolutely wonderful, and these are a bright red foliage color in the spring. Spectacular color. What are these guys over here? Thank you for asking, because they're really special. And look, Mark, there's one on each yeah. corner, yeah. on all four corners. It's Cunninghamia, and this may be around the furthest point north it'll grow. I've seen these 
this size in uh, Virginia. But uh, we actually had them out in the nursery in three gallon pots and they made it through the winter just outside. So hmm. um, it may be a lot tougher than I'm suggesting, but. Um, well, they're, they're wonderful trees. About when did you put these in? At the same time as the LA? Uh, a little bit later. A bit later. They're very nice. sort of grew. Very nice. Well. But you have to come around this side. Tell me when to stop. <laughs> no, it's I'm I'm following you. We can. Uh, but again, it's all about foliage color. With these being red in the spring and those being variegated, and look at these variegated boxwoods. Yeah. Yeah, they're enormous. Cephalotaxis, the low uh, Japanese plum you. We've got two more. Of these uh of these trees, all four corners? Yes. Are you losing all your blue spruce too? Yeah. Why is that? Why is it? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I was gonna ask you. They, they seem like they're just dying everywhere. So this is the meadow. It's beautiful. Which at the moment is featuring lots of our asters. Uh, the asters are incredible. Did you uh, did you seed this at some point? How no, did this kind of come to be? We've uh, planted plants throughout. So okay. No, I didn't go for. I mean, I knew Christopher Lloyd. We talked about meadows, and the process that he used of covering it all with black plastic for a year. To, I mean, that whole thing did not appeal. Uh -huh. And he, of course, ended up with a much more beautiful meadow, but um, this is too large to play with the idea of covering it all with black plastic. What, what does that do? Kill all the seeds that are in the ground? What's, yeah, exactly. So you don't get all the... But I love a lot of the native grasses. There are some weeds in there that are a total pain, but um, at any rate, I want there are a few more things to show you down here. I bet you see all kinds of wildlife out here. Well, a lot of deer, unfortunately. <laughs> you got a lot of birds in here? Oh, yeah. Uh, the New Jersey Audubon comes here and loves the bird tours that they do. Oh, yeah. They, they have a great time. This is a fabulous plant, Pinus parviflora. Absolutely a wonderful plant. Look at the shape that it takes, but also... Almost the, looks like something you'd see like near the ocean. Yes, it sort of, does. How it's like sort of windswept like that. Yeah, or you know? like a black pine or something. But yeah. look, well, first off, look at the blue line in the needles, which is really spectacular. Yeah, it is. So it gives it a blue-gray look. And then all these pine cones that stay on it for a very long time. That's open enough, too, that you can appreciate them. Exactly. Over in the distance, I have a variegated one. And I have silver gray Pinus parviflora up in another part of the garden. Well, Rennie, I just want to thank you so much for taking your time to come out and talk with us today and show everybody of your course. piece of art here that's taken, what, 42 years to evolve? <laughs> I mean, 42 years of hard labor. No, it's been great fun. It's the journey, not the destination, yeah. you know, and it's been fun creating this over uh, the last 42 years. Well, it is. Finding um, pieces like this in France and, you know, having it shipped back. These are meant to look, it's Pyrus salicifolia, meant to look like an olive tree uh, with the uh, French village fountain, so we call this. Actually, this is the gravel garden that uh, uh, is named so for Beth Chateau's wonderful uh, gravel garden in England. And her books are the best if you want to read wonderful books, Dan Hinckley's and Beth Chateau's and uh, the, all the books about Great Dixter, um, Christopher Lloyd's books. So. Ken just drawing inspiration from a bunch of other interesting people too. Exactly. Well, this is this is quite the place. I mean, it's, it's great to see and for other people to come and enjoy and know that, especially in this area, I know driving in, you see a lot of developments popping up here and there and everywhere. And to know that you preserved this place so many years ago and evolved it into this 
incredible, incredible place to walk around will be preserved as your legacy really for many more well, generations to come. I mean, what could be a better feeling? Exactly, really, it's you know? pretty nice. And the gardens will remain open. I may be moving uh, along to another garden actually, yeah. but the gardens here are going to remain open to the public. Uh, May through uh, the end of October, so. Well, you'll get to go and start on some new projects. Exactly. Somewhere else I and just keep the. I have one in mind. Oh yeah, <laughs> always keeping the ball rolling. It's exactly. always about the journey, right? Exactly. Okay, well, thank, thank you, you so much. Mike. And if you want to learn more about some of Rennie's literature, go to uh, go to the description in this YouTube video, and I'll list all the titles for some really cool stuff that he's been a part of, and some of the inspiration that's come from this farm itself. So. For now, thank you guys so much for watching this video, our video. I hope you liked it. I'll see you next time.